Uh, uh, first off, welcome to VR MMO Church. Glad you're here with us. Uh, we've been going through the book of Mark, uh, and now we are in Mark chapter 16. This is the last book of Mark, and there's some very interesting things about it. We'll, we'll get to in a moment. But uh, to recap the story so far, uh, Mark is one of the Gospels. It's one of the Synoptic Gospels. It's one of the first written. Basically, Synoptic Gospels are three Gospels that use a lot of each other's uh, material. They're all very similar. Um, they kind of borrow from each other as they're written. So uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the Synoptic Gospels. John is not considered one of the Synoptic Gospels. And so that means that uh, a lot of like Matthew, uh, Mark, and Luke are sort of copy-paste of each other. And so what most likely happened is Mark was written first, and um, uh, Matthew and Luke um, used Mark's account and filled in their own details that they remembered or knew from Christ's life, uh, to sort of add on to it. Um, and uh, at the end of each gospel, because each gospel is about the story of Jesus' life, um, you have the crucifixion story. So we have several crucifixion stories um, in Scripture, and they all kind of line up. Uh, but that's where we are in Mark. So where we last left off, um, Jesus was uh, arrested. Uh, um, he was put through really sort of a, a farce of a trial. Um, and he was crucified, which means he was uh, executed, um, basically for challenging uh, the Jewish status quo and for saying that he was the son of God. And... During his uh, crucifixion, Peter, who swore that he would uh, never leave Jesus aside, never deny him, uh, does in fact deny Christ three times. Uh, and um, Peter and really all the disciples are kind of been hiding um, because they fear that they may be next. Since they were close followers of Jesus. Um, but especially Peter um, is pro not just hiding from people in general because of his association with Jesus, but is really kind of shying away, most likely. This is not clarified in Scripture, but we'll get to why I talk about this later. Um, is most likely hiding from some of the other disciples as well because he turned his back on Jesus and um, denied that he even knew what it was when he, uh, he was sort of called out for that. So we're at sort of a dark uh, period in, in the Gospel story. And uh, Jesus' body was taken by Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph was uh, not Jesus' father, Joseph. A uh, different Joseph was a very common name. Um, who was a counselor, meaning he was most likely on the Sanhedrin. Um, he would have been on the council that was responsible for arresting and um, putting Christ to death. Uh, but uh, scripture is uh, clear, especially in other Gospels, that he was not one of the ones who uh, wanted this to happen. So he either argued against or um, abstained somewhere, was just not present um, at the, the trial of Jesus. So they give him the body because he's in this position of authority. Um, and uh, Jesus is put in this tomb. And uh, according to some scholars and historians, there was an especially large uh, stone put in front of the tomb to steal it, to, to seal it, to prevent anyone from um, stealing the body or anything like that. There were guards that were positioned outside the tomb as well, according to other Gospels. And where we're going to pick up today in Mark is the story of uh, three women. So we have uh, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome. And they are going to put burial spices on Jesus' body. So burial spices had nothing to do with preserving the body, but it it was just sort of an act of love and reverence. And it's it's similar to, um, in sort of our modern culture, putting flowers on a grave. Um, flowers smell nice. Um, and that is sort of uh, the same type of context of this. So they they could go into the tomb and they would put these spices on, on Jesus' body and it would cause the tomb to smell nice instead of smelling like a rotting corpse. Um, so they're going just, this is this act of love, this act of respect to go and, and take care of the tomb and do this, this nice thing. Body. So Saturday evening when the Sabbath ended, uh, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome went out and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. Very early on on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. 
On the way there, they're asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? Again, uh, probably an especially large stone uh, because of the um, high-profile circumstances. This is death. And they are three women, and they're not super strong. They're trying to figure out, hey, how are we going to get this stone away so that we can use these spices that we just purchased and, and anoint his body? But as they arrived, they look up, looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, was already rolled side. So that would have been pretty strange to see from a distance. But as they got closer to the tomb and entered it, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. Um, so this is sort of a literary device here, but what Mark is basically telling us, this young man in the white robe uh, is an angel. And the other gospels make this uh, even clearer. This is an angel. Uh, and this angel is there to deliver a very specific message to the women. The women were shocked, but the angel said, Don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Um, different translations say he is risen, he has risen. Uh, in the original language, the the implication there is that he he has been risen, that God has, God has resurrected him in some way that the Clearly a divine thing that has occurred. Look, this is where they laid his body. Um, so just to emphasize, his body is not here. The tomb is empty. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter. It's interesting, we're going to step back to this in a second. That Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. So we have a couple examples of Jesus, most notably at the Last Supper, where he just sort of, says um, at, the, at the Last Supper, hey, uh, after I rise again, we'll meet in Galilee. And the disciples didn't understand what that meant then. Um, but uh, that's why the angel is saying this here. Just as he told you before he died, he's going to go ahead to Galilee and he will meet you there. But here's what is interesting here. Verse 7. I think this is really beautiful. And we'll even come back to this later. Uh, now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you including Peter. Why would the angel say this? Tell his disciples, including Peter. Um, this language is including Peter in the ranks of the disciples, right? Uh, some translations say, tell his disciples and Peter, which seems like it could be exclusionary, but that's not the purpose of the text. This is including Peter in the disciples. So this angel is sending a message uh, through these women, to the other disciples, that Peter is still a disciple, that Peter is still in the family, so to speak. That just because Peter denied Christ does not mean that Christ is going to deny, or just because Peter denied Jesus, does not mean that Jesus is going to deny him. Um, Peter most likely would have been scared or ashamed Um that, that's not, not feared for his life, but ashamed to even look any of the other apostles in the eye after denying Christ the way that he did. So this is the angel specifically sending this message that Peter is still a disciple. Um, and they would have, they won't in Mark, but they will have in the other Gospels, you'll see this sort of rec conversation of reconciliation um, between Peter and Jesus. Uh, that sort of echoes when Peter denied Jesus, and Jesus gives him three chances. This is Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus will give Peter three chances to reaffirm um, his his uh, love. So verse 7, you'll see him there, just as he told you before he died. And then verse 8, the women fled from the tomb, trembling and bewildered, and they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. Uh, and a very interesting thing about this is uh, that's actually the end of Mark chapter 16. Or that's the end of, end of Mark, actually, period. Uh, you'll note there are more verses here, and we will go through those. Um, but in the earliest manuscripts that we have available, there is nothing after this verse. Verse 8 is the last verse in the entire book of Mark. Um, so you may say, Pastor Zach, that seems weird. Why is there more text here that wasn't... Uh, that, that wasn't actually part of the original manuscript. So we'll, we'll talk about that for a second. Um, so you'll also see, actually, I think I think this does a good job. Let me look at some of these. Okay, no, they are numbered. Okay. So, back. Okay. 
Uh, so there are a few reasons that scholars attribute to there not being anything past verse 8 in the original, or the oldest manuscripts that we have. One is that this was intentional, that uh, Mark intended for the book to end on this sort of cliffhanger, this idea of these women are now faced with the truth that Jesus is alive, and they're given this um, message to meet Jesus in Galilee, right? Like, they have the gospel. They have the, the gospel means good news. The good news is that Jesus is alive, and that this is intentionally a cl cliffhanger as a sort of rhetorical uh, storytelling device for the reader to stop and think, that just like these three women, what will they do now that they have this message? So that's one uh, version, one interpretation of why this ends at verse 8. Another is that Mark planned to write more in this book, but that he was very, very old. He simply died before he had the chance to finish writing, um, which is also plausible. Uh, there's also this idea that he did, in fact, write more uh, at the end of the book. Um, and uh, there is some uh, 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 evidence really for all three of, of these uh, uh, proposed reasons. Um, one that is interesting is that Mark sort of writes in this very specific format and this sort of repetitive uh, use of um, some, some grammatical devices that he had uh, available to him, and that he started a new pattern here and he didn't finish it. Um, but uh, so some scholars think he might have written in a codex, which you could think of like the way that a, a book is today, like uh, not too far from our, our modern idea of what a book would be, uh, but that in a codex, that the last page or pages of the codex would be um, very susceptible to damage and therefore being lost over time. Uh, and so that is another possibility um, that uh, Mark was finished and then that was just lost to time. So then, where did the rest of these verses come from then? Um, when we have after this verse 8 here, uh, where did the rest of the come from? Uh, and the answer to that is most likely were added by scribes who believed the story was incomplete and felt compelled to sort of add this extra bit in. Um, so when we see here what's on this slide, this is actually considered the intermediate ending to the Book of so this one also believed to have been added by scribes, and it's sort of the short version of that ending. Um, if you have a physical Bible at your disposal, or even in some Bible apps, what you will see is that after verse 8, everything after verse 8 in uh, the book of Mark will have brackets around it. Uh, and that is what indicates, so usually it will be like a footnote as well, and that's what indicates that this was not in the original or the, the earliest manuscripts that we have available. So this is the intermediate ending. So this is like the really high level summary and most likely was the one that was written last, interestingly enough. So we're going to look at this first. Uh, but after this, when we get into verse nine, that was um, probably one of the older endings that were added by the scribes. And then this one was probably added uh, maybe 100 or 200 years later to some manuscripts to sort of replace that longer ending and just make it more, more concise. So. Then they briefly reported all this to Peter and his companions. So essentially what we're doing is we're taking information that we know from the other Gospels about what happened at the end of the story, and they're, they're kind of attaching it to Mark's writing here. So when it says that the woman fled, uh, and they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened, um, the scribes want you to know that, no, that it's not that they didn't speak to anyone, it's they didn't speak to anyone else other than who the angel told them to speak to. They reported this to Peter and his companions, to Peter and the other disciples. Afterwards, Jesus himself sent them out from east to west with the sacred and unfailing message of salvation that gives eternal life. Amen. Um, so this is the very high level. This is the TLDR of, of what the scribes added um, to the end of the book of Mark. So this is the TLDR. Um, they, the, the women tell Peter and Jesus sends them out with the message of salvation. Um, and so now we're going to go to... Uh, what the what the scribes added, and again, since so these are not the original writings of Mark, this is no longer. We're not talking about like primary witness kind of material anymore. Um, so um, just make sure that we have that uh, in in that context. This is the scribes who feel like they needed to add this extra context 
Afterward, he appeared in a different form to two of his followers who were walking from Jerusalem into the country. They rushed back to tell the others, but no one believed them. Again, this is a story from one of the other Gospels appears um, to uh, two of the disciples who were walking. Still later, he appeared to the eleven disciples as they were eating together. He rebuked them for their stubborn unbelief because they refused to believe those who had seen him after he had been raised from the dead. Again, these are uh, high-level summaries of what we see in the other Gospels after the resurrection. Then he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. Now we're about to talk about some miraculous signs. The scribes are not clear when they're saying this, whether this was something that was indicated as a prediction of just Jesus' disciples at this time period to accompany the, the, his sort of true disciples, or whether this is a, a promise for all who believe. Um, and this confusion uh, has caused um, a lot of really toxic, terrible theology and death in the church. Um, and we'll get to that in a moment. Um, scribes say they will cast out demons in my name, and they will speak in new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety, and if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick, and they will be... So as the scribes, not Mark, as the scribes are outlining these things, um, some folks who don't understand that this was added by scribes, and the scribes are not specific about this, um, have taken this to believe that the way to show that you're a true believer is to drink poison and not be hurt and to handle venomous snakes and not die, um, which uh, I think is personally is very terrible and toxic theology and not a good way to interpret this. I think that takes things kind of out of context. Um, uh, but uh, this is a thing that some churches have done, and when people die, those churches would just say, well, they, didn't, they weren't true believers because they died when they drank that poison. They were real believers that wouldn't. Um, and uh, I don't think that's even what the scribes are trying to say here. So we have that several levels removed from, I guess, what we'll say um, reality or primary witness, right? Is there scribes that are saying this, not the original writer, Mark. This is a couple, at least uh, 100 to 200 years after Jesus died, that the scribes added this in. So it may be that they saw uh, or heard of some of the disciples doing these things, and then they chose to add that into Mark as something that did accompany those believers, uh, but is not necessarily something that is like a, a modern context or a requirement for belief, but it gets interpreted um, sometimes, which I think is very, very dangerous. When the Lord Jesus had finished talking with them, he was taken up into heaven and sat down at the place of honor at God's right hand. The disciples went everywhere and preached, and the Lord worked through this, confirming what they said by many miraculous signs. Again, just saying, like, this is a thing that happened. The disciples went, and they preached, and the Lord worked through them and confirmed what they said by many signs. Um, and that is the end of the scribe's note. So, again, we'll back up here, and you can see why this is sort of a, a, a high-level summary. They reported all this to Peter. Jesus sent them from east to west with the unfailing message of salvation. Um, I think that's much more concise and less likely to be um, interpreted in um, some danger of toxic. Um, but to close us out, I want to take us back to the true known ending of Mark. Here in verse 7. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. We'll see him there just as he told you before he died. And what is particularly special about this is this idea of including Peter as someone who made a promise to Jesus himself to his face right in scripture it talks about blessed are those who believe and do not see right referring to those who um, believe in God and gospel of love and of redemption and didn't get to walk with Jesus and see him face to face because of how more, much more challenging that is, right? But we see someone who looked Jesus in the eye, right? And said that he would never deny Jesus, who did, in fact, deny Jesus. And the message for him is, you are included among my disciples. That, that Peter, even without asking for that forgiveness, right? Like, that he is uh, included in the 
at Jesus' disciples despite his failings, despite his sin coming. Um, and I think that that's just a wonderful message for us and a reminder that Mark himself gives us at the end of this chapter, uh, right? Like when Jesus' ministry starts, Peter is one of the first people that he meets. And Peter is sort of a primary witness for all of Christ's life. And Mark is telling this story of Peter. He ends his book, whether intentionally or unintentionally, with Peter being included despite his shortcomings among Jesus disciples. And I just think there's a lot of, of, of hope in that for us, that no matter what we've done, no matter how we have, have turned our back on God or what mistakes that we have made, that God still in family, that we don't need to be ashamed. Like Romans 8, 1 says, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. I know I, I personally spent a lot of my life wondering, you know, in my times of doubt, in my times of unbelief, right? Like, have I crossed this line? Have I gone too far? And I'm I'm no longer, you know, considered part of the family that I'm not going to be saved or I'm not going to get to heaven. And I lived in this like weird sort of fear. Um, but this is Mark's example of, of letting us know that that's not something that we need here. Um, because just because we, we doubt or sometimes even turn our back completely on God does not mean turns his back on us. And I just think that that is so wonderful. Um, so we're going to end there, um, kind of a short chapter today, um, especially short chapter if we start, stop where Mark actually stops, but even with the scribe notes, it's still relatively short. We're going to end there, and I'm going to go ahead and close this out in prayer. God, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you so much for the sacrifice that you made for your words. There's no greater love than this, than a man lay down his life for another. and so thankful that that is what you did for us, God, that you set that example for us, that you didn't, didn't compromise on your love for us, and that even when we turn our back on you the way that Peter turned his back on you, God, that you still count us in your family, that you still count us uh, among your God, I thank you so much for everything you've done in and through VR and MMO Church and everything you're going to continue to do in and through. In Jesus' name, amen.